All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Stannard. I have the distinct pleasure this morning of being able to moderate our session from the osteotomy course on osteotomies around the knee. Uh, we are expecting a very large group, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all. Hopefully, those of you who are just joining the course for the first time will explain at the end how to catch up on a lot of the content that's out on the, on the uh, web. Uh, this is an internet live session and all the content that's presented and discussed is the intellectual property of our AONA faculty and the content authors involved. Um, my faculty for this session that's on uh, periarticular knee and distal femur uh, are Mauricio Kafuri, my partner here at Missouri, Mike Miranda from Connecticut and Tim Weber from Indianapolis. Uh, it's a, a phenomenal faculty that uh, I'm uh, very proud to join. This shows our disclosures uh, and our roles in this course. So I'll let you have a moment just to take a, a peek at those. This session is being recorded uh, so that we can uh, reuse it and have it up on the YouTube channel, et cetera, that we'll talk about at the end. And it, it will be so posted to different social media sites such as that, as well as at aona.org and aotrauma.org. If you don't want to be included in the recording, leave your camera turned off and your microphone muted at all times. All rights for educational resources and assets used and owned by AO North America, the AO Foundation, and all its contributors are for educational purposes only. Recording or copying any aspect of the educational activity is strictly prohibited. I'd like to remind everybody, especially with the large group we're expecting this morning, some Zoom meeting etiquette. At the start of the meeting, our host will mute all the microphones and turn off the video of all participants except for panelists and presenters and moderators. In the dedicated chat for the meeting, please use the Q&A function to ask questions and that's being monitored and then they'll pass those questions on to us. Um, all general questions should go to me, the moderator. If there's questions you have for one of our specific panelists, if you'll indicate that in your question, then we'll make sure that goes to them. The learning objectives for this morning's session are the following. We want you all to be able to list the indications for periarticular knee deformity correction and non-union management. We want you to be able to utilize deformity correction techniques to restore extra articular alignment and then recognize the operative techniques for intra-articular osteotomies. This is the phenomenal faculty that's been assembled for this whole course and, and it's really a, a, a wonderful group of educators and then you can see the red boxes around the group that I have the pleasure of leading today. This is what our agenda is gonna look like today. Uh, we're gonna to start out with Mauricio Kafuri and Mike Miranda, and they'll be hitting both extra and intraarticular deformities and corrections around the distal femur. Then we'll have a short period of question and answer and, and we'll summarize. Then we'll do the same exact combination around the proximal tibia. I'll do the extra articular and Tim Weber We'll take the intraarticular. We'll have another uh, question and answer session, and then we'll have a couple of cases at the end and an expert panel discussion. So it looks like a, a really good session. I think we're ready now to get going with Mauricio, so I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Mauricio. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Once again, I would like to thank Ayotram North America for inviting me to share with you about extra-articular distal femur osteotomies. The learning objectives of this lecture are that at the end of this session, the learner will be able to understand the differences between a single cut and a biplanar cut for a distal femur osteotomy recognize technical aspects regards open versus closing wedge osteotomies, and acknowledge the variety of conditions that may be addressed by a distal femur osteotomy. Let's go back to the beginning. This is the first osteotomy that has been reported in the area of the knee. It was performed on May 27, 1835. The surgeon is John Rhea Barton. This is a procedure that was performed to address a knee ankylosis, and the patient was a physician. This physician had a knee septic arthritis when he was nine years old. 
and he had a terrible flexion contracture of the knee. Dr. Barton performed this procedure, which was a closing anterior wedge to the distal femur in five minutes without anesthesia. And he took care not to break the posterior cortex, as you can see. So he removed the wedge and then gradually he was bringing this leg to extension with splints and casts in order not to cause any laceration to the popliteal artery. Very ingenious at that time in the 19th century. And there is a letter of the patient to Dr. Barton saying that this has been a life-changing procedure for himself because it allowed him to go back to his practice, to life, even to hide, ride horses. An impressive outcome for somebody that was not able to walk. The traditional teaching says that distal femur osteotomies, extraarticular distal femur osteotomies, should be advocated for the treatment of valgus knees. I'm going to show you that this is not exactly the only purpose. This is, for instance, a patient who is a 68 year old male that came to me with right knee pain, substantial valgus deformity, previous uh, surgical procedures to the leg, a successful left total knee arthroplasty. And when you see and you run the preoperative planning, as has been pointed out during this course, uh, it's important to see that the knee has valgus, but it's not coming from the distal femur. The distal femur, as a matter of fact, is in varus, and the proximal tibia is in valgus. So then you have to go where the money is. You have to address the deformity where the deformity is located. And this is why for this patient, instead of doing a total knee replacement, because the, even having a tricompartimental arthritis to do a total knee replacement in a patient with this obliquity of the joint line would be very challenging, we decided to stage the procedure performing first, a medial closing wedge tibial osteotomy, just to bring his MPTA to normal values, allowing for then proceed uh, to a total knee replacement a primary one without a hinge, without any kind of um, wedges or metal wedges, preserving bone stock. And this is the outcome after. So if you understand where the deformity is, you're going to see that this is not a situation where you say valgus is a situation where you have to do distal femur osteotomy. Currently, there is an interesting discussion about shall we go with a single cut or a biplanar cut for a distal femur? This is how it looks like a single cut. It's a complete cut that includes the anterior cortex, the posterior cortex, and it goes all the way to the opposite cortex, leaving a hinge. The biplanar cut in the other way around just cuts the posterior three quarters of the cortex and leaves the anterior cortex intact. To cut the anterior cortex, you're gonna do an horizontal cut under the cortex. It's a very interesting concept, and I'm going to explain to you why this has some advantages. First, if you see what happens to the hinge, the area of the hinge that you have with the biplanar cut is smaller, but you can imagine uh, that in this kind of situation, you have a much broader surface contact, as you can see in the drawing. And when you go with an horizontal cut, also you're under the cortex and therefore, you're not touching the quadriceps or the extensor mechanism of the knee. So in more details, what happens with the biplanar cut is that you does not harm the extensor mechanism of the knee as the anterior cortex is intact. And it allows for a more distal cut under the trochlea where you have metaphyseal bone. You can go lower. You can go to an area where the bone has great blood supply and more flexibility than the cortical bone. And this allows you uh, to have a more stable construct. The other plus of a biplanar cut, doesn't matter if you go for open wedge or a closing wedge, is that you're going to have a broader surface area in a shorter healing time. If you see in this uh, chart, you're gonna compare lateral uniplanar a medial uniplanar versus lateral biplanar and medial biplanar. And you see how broad is the surface area when you're dealing with a biplanar cut because you have the horizontal cut that includes the new surfaces C and D that you don't have with the uni uniplanar cut. With uniplanar uh, um, cut, you're just going to have A and B surfaces. 
with a biplanar, you add C and D. Open wedge versus closing wedge. It's an interesting discussion. You can see here the lateral open wedge and the, in contrast, the medial closing wedge. And it's a very different concept. In my practice, when I do one or the other, I always do biplanar for the reasons I already explained to you. And in order to decide if you're going to do a lateral open or a medial closing, it's not a kind of um, mathematical thing. You have to pay attention to many details like leg length discrepancy, the amount of deformity that you want to correct, patient's profile, osteoporosis, and too many other things that are related to the situation. In summary, the lateral open wedge is for sure easier to perform, uh, while the medial closing wedge is going to have a broader surface area and a faster healing. The lateral open wedge, however, has more complications related to the hardware, which uh, is always going to cause friction to the IT band, and very often you have to come back for hardware removal. And the medial closing wedge is technically more demanding, and many surgeons are sometimes concerned about the neurovascular structures on the medial side, which are I would say it's absolutely safe to go distal medial. Technical aspects. So it's a critical thing that you define the point of the hinge. And this is a, a very important thing to share with you. When you see the C arm with a good AP, you have to see the shadow of the femoral condyle, and you have to see the shadow of the opposite cortex of your osteotomy, and exactly where you have the uh, convergence of these two lines is where you'd like to have your hinge. And you see that with a medial uh, distal closing wedge, you can go very low. And there is where you do your oblique cut, and there is where you do your horizontal cut. Also, it's a critical thing to always have a protection or a, a Holman retractor in the back. In, so we open the septum and we make sure that you have the homon very flush to the bone. And then you go with your saw exactly following the homon. Some clinical cases for you. Valgus deformity. This is a 47 year old male, tricompartmental knee arthritis and severe pain and severe valgus as you can see. He had years ago a medial closing wedge osteotomy performed to the right side but for the left side, he came for a total knee replacement. When I talked to him, I said, you're 47. I'll try to get your alignment back first <clears throat> and then see what happens. And eventually we may consider a knee replacement later. This is how the preoperative planning looks like. You see, he has a significant reduction of the MLDFA uh, and he has a significant valgus. In this case, these are the steps. So you try to find the ideal trajectory of your osteotomy with K wires, and then we create a cage for the K wires, determining the wedge exactly on the medial side and trying to converge to the ideal hinge point. Then you resect the wedge in a biplanar fashion. Then you close it. I like to have wires to secure my wedge. And then I come with a plate on the medial side and I try to make sure that I don't have any recurvation or anti-curvation of this distal femur. The other thing is here you see how it heals together, and here you see how it compares before and after. It's a huge difference in terms of mechanical alignment, pelvic obliquity, gait quality, and this patient is now asymptomatic despite having tricompartmental arthritis. Another use for distal femur osteotomy is various deformity. This is a 59-year-old female who had a history of previous infected hip replacement, osteoporosis, distal femur periprosthetic fracture. This is how she came to the hospital. You see the bone quality is not great. She has cement up to the distal femur. She has a very long stem and she's an, an, on antibiotic suppression. She had a, a distal femur fixation with a plate. This is how it looks like. But right after you see she's losing alignment and she's collapsing in varus and then progressing in varus. And this is the time when she was sent to me for an evaluation. And then I see that she has significant varus and shortening pain. She has a long hip stem. She has cement that goes all the way down, short working area in the distal femur osteoporosis. 
So this is the planning. We took the hardware out, everything we could take out. Then we planned an open wedge medial, not a closing wedge medial. Again, you see a biplanar cut. The horizontal cut is done with the plate, with the saw parallel to the anterior cortex. We use a, a, a special device to protect the posterior cortex. We open a wedge and we fix the medial side with a buttress plate. And then to avoid stress risers, we also protect the hinge on the opposite side and we, we bypass the, the hip stem. This is six weeks after. You see the pelvis is leveled. The leg length is very close. Uh, the fracture is, uh, is almost completely, um, you cannot see the osteotomy anymore. And, uh, and this patient is very functional and very happy. You see the comparison. At least, and finally, torsional deformities. This is a patient that had right knee pain, previous patellectomy, valgus knee deformity. She went to see a doctor who recommended a total knee replacement, um, and she accepted the idea to have a total knee replacement, and she had it. But then, uh, right after the knee replacement, she had the dislocation of the extensor mechanism. At 30 degrees, the extensor mechanism was dislocated. Then this case was sent to me, we did the torsional evaluation with CT scans and we could figure out that the distal femur was internally rotated by 22 degrees. And then instead of doing a complete revision in eight weeks after surgery, we decided to go, to go for a supracondylar uh, derotational osteotomy. And those pins that you see uh, above and below the osteotomy, those are the pins that are giving me guidance about the rotation. And also they helped me to hold this um, osteotomy stable because I have a, an external fixator bar holding all together uh, to avoid displacement of the shaft. And then I do my derotation, I fix. In this case, I would say uh, you can see a slight gap on the medial side, which I don't appreciate much. And most likely it's because the osteotomy was not completely perpendicular to the axis of the femur which may also generate some deformity, but she ended up healing and she's completely asymptomatic. She no longer has dislocation of the extensor mechanism. It's another use of distal femur osteotomies. Take home messages. Distal femur osteotomies uh, are procedures that have a long history of almost two centuries. Currently better understanding regards plane of the deformity, three dimension of the deformity, bone healing, stability of the constructs, we have had too many new developments, especially in the last two decades. Biplanar cuts have a broader surface area, less harm to the extensor mechanism of the knee. Close and wedge techniques are inherently more stable and they have a faster healing. Distal femur osteotomies do not apply just for valgus deformities of the knee. You are able to correct deformities in the frontal, sagittal, and axial plane. Thank you very much. And I hand over to my next colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Mauricio. We'll now turn it over to Mike Miranda, and he's going to talk about intraarticular osteotomies. Mike. Morning, everyone. There we go. So outstanding talk, Mauricio. That was, uh, as usual, uh, outstanding. Um, okay, so my task this morning is to talk about intraarticular malunions of the distal femur, look at indications uh, for osteotomy and techniques. So um, as is typical with the AO, we have a, a group of friends that support us and help us. And uh, so for this talk, I'd like to uh, especially recognize both Mauricio as well as Professor Joe Sasker. Joe is a um, uh, an actually pioneer uh, uh, in this particular subject, uh, in addition to his many other subjects. So I'd like to recognize uh, all the help he's provided for uh, this particular talk. So our learning objectives this morning are to review some of the anatomy as well as approaches to the distal femur, talk about the indications for osteotomy and the scientific basis for them, as well as go through some techniques in dealing with these metaphyseal and epiphyseal fracture malunions. So we're gonna start off with a case so this is a 70-year-old woman who presents status post a complex distal femur fracture about eight months status post repair. You can see that her original fixation was a hybrid fixation. So she has non-locking screws proximally. She has locking screws distally. 
She had no lag fixation at the joint and a bridging construct. This went on to fail, and you could see failure of the hardware as well as a non-union at the metadiaphyseal uh, junction, as well as a malunion at the articular surface. Okay, so when we gather up and generate a problem list for this unfortunate patient, she has an epiphyseal uh, malunion with stuff off. She has metaphyseal non-union. She has osteopenia and osteoporosis that we uh, know about. She also will have defects from her previous implants. And so we have to start generating a plan for this. Her clinical exam is that of a synovitic knee. Overall, the lower extrem uh, extremity is deconditioned from, uh, from non-functional use. Uh, she also has uh, varus alignment and she has limited range of motion from scarring as well as synovitis. And you can see that her intraop photos you can see why the knee is so painful for her. She's got this fairly extensive synovitis there, and you can see her malunion. And her clinical presentation is pretty consistent with these, with those patients having uh, this particular malady. That is that they present with pain, stiffness, they have instability, they have some deformity. Radiographically, they have some incongruity of their joint. They have a malunion. Uh, they have some bony demineralization, and they'll have varying degrees of osteoarthritis. So how can we help these folks when they present to us? Well, in order to successfully address these cases, you have to have an awareness of the pathology and what the variation is from normal. You have to have a knowledge base, which includes information, particularly anatomy in that particular area. You have to understand the principles and management for these patients. You have to have a certain set of technical, technical skill sets, uh, and these are usually several, but you also need the resources uh, uh, in order to accomplish the task, the tools, as well as implants. All these things are necessary. And just with complex fracture surgery, I always approach it and think about it, the fact that these are really, in these cases, it's advanced application of the basic principles. So keeping yourself aware of those basic principles are key. So those fracture principles that we may employ are the restoration of the articular con congruity, restoration of normal alignment length and rotation. We want to maintain the blood supply and create stable fixation with compression of the articular surfaces. So this is our true north. This is what help guides us as we're working through these problems. Well, in this situation of intraarticular malunions, is it the same? Well, it's a little bit different. What we wanna do is we wanna restore the articular congruity wherever possible. We wanna restore normal alignment. We may need to unload that malunion. We need to maintain the blood supply and make sure that we get compression of articular surfaces. And there's plenty of literature uh, which extends back a, a number of years, which uh, 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 creates support uh, for this intervention and for our approach for this intervention. We know that it's a stable, an accurately reduced joint uh, will give us the optimal outcome given the situation. And there's a fair amount of data uh, recently in literature that uh, poses a potential uh, reason why this pathoanatomy or pathophysiology uh, uh, comes to fruition. So Furman and a uh, paper at uh, JOT in 2006 proposed a mechanism where at the joint level, you know that there's incongruity and there's joint instability, there's altered joint biomechanics, creates an inflammatory response. This initiates an aberrant repair response. You get enzymatic degradation, you get matrix destruction, mechanical failure, and this leads to the clinical outcome of joint destruction, pain, and disability. So there is a scientific basis for our intervention. Well, what other knowledge do we need to know? Certainly distal femur anatomy is uh, complex and the vascular anatomy is what I wanna draw your attention to. And I specifically wanna make two points. One is that you really have to have a thorough under understanding of the different approaches for these cases. And you have to understand that the posterior medial condyle of the distal femur has a limited vascular supply and you need to be careful with that. And I'll explain why. When you look at the various approaches around the knee, these are some that you're, uh, I'm sure in this audience are, are familiar with. The established lateral approach is something that was used. It's primarily a distal femoral diaphyseal approach, which is extended to the joint. 
It has some advantages in that it's extensile, but it really gives you poor joint exposure. It's really a trial to try and do intraarticular work. So it may be put aside as a, as a lesser option. Midline approach is helpful because you get a parapatellar uh, either medially or laterally, you, both, you sublux the patella and you can visualize the joint nicely. One of those approaches, as described by Credic and his group, the TARPO approach as the transarticular percutaneous osteosynthesis is really a lateral retinacular approach, which uh, you can see here, helps you visualize the entirety of the joint, especially even uh, uh, medial and posterior. It's soft tissue sparing. The disadvantage is that it's not extensile on the lateral side proximally, so you may have to make secondary incisions in order to get plate fixation more along the shaft. You flex the knee and you can really get all around to the medial side. Well, what about that medial side? Is it tricky? As um, Mauricio said, um, there is a safe zone that's available, but you want to avoid dissecting posteriorly on the medial side. And we'll explain, you can see in the schematic how uh, there's a, a limited blood supply to that posterior aspect. If you were to look at a dissection that was performed, you can see that if you dissect all the way up to the high, uh, adductor hiatus, one can appreciate that the, uh, the vascularity is robust anteriorly, but there's a relative paucity posteriorly. And this is again uh, pointed out in these schematics. You can see here that on the medial side, the limited vascular supply uh, is supplied by the superior medial geniculate artery, whereas laterally you have the superior and inferior lateral geniculate arteries. So you have to be just careful in your planning and execution. It's not that it's contraindicated, just care is needed. So back to the joint itself. What do we need to do uh, to correct the joint? We need to create articular congruity, stability, and recreate the alignment. How, does that, how did these manifest themselves or translate themselves into the malunions that we're concerned about? Well, you can have articular surface malunions, you can have coronal plane, plane malunions like Hoffa, or you can have rotational or condylar malunions. Let's look at the articular malreduction. So our goal would be to decrease the step off less than two millimeters. Often you see this in combination with uh, an impaction or a condylar rotation and those need to be addressed wherever it's possible. We know that we cannot accept a step off deformity more than two times the thickness of the articular cartilage or we'll start to run into problems with uh, degradation. So this is a gentleman, 42 years old. He's status post to knee pain, uh, I'm sorry, status post to fall and he presents with a complaint of knee pain. He was initially managed non-operatively. You can see on these initial radiographs, there's some deformity of the medial condyle. You can also see that there's some uh, callus formation along the medial adductor tubercle. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this should be noted because it's very rare that you see uh, uh, callus formation with fractures or in the metaphysis. It often means that either one, they were bone grafted at some point or two, there's a, a, a non-union. Here you can see on a, a sunrise view that the uh, fracture extends across the joint and we can characterize this as a unicondylar uh, non-union, malunion, and the CT bears this out. And it's not uncommon that you see a non-union component with malunion and vice versa. You see spot welding, and that's a little bit of malunion with non-union work as well. So you have to be prepared for that. So in this particular situation, medial approach, you can lift up subvastus, get access to the medial condyle. You can see very, very nice uh, uh, access and then go in, fix this with compression after mobilizing that condyle and fixation. And here at 19 month follow-up, you can see that there's still a, a, a diastasis in the notch, um, excuse me, and uh, uh, that reflects the fact that with time, the uh, cartilage will die and you'll recede just like it does at the fracture ends, a uh, uh, free fracture fragment. And you also wanna make sure that as you're executing your osteotomy, you avoid levering, levering on the soft metaphyseal bone. So the take homes from that particular case are that malunions in the metaphysis are all often associated with some non-union and you also lose, uh, often lose cartilage and bone at the osteotomy site. Compression is key. Well, what about this gentleman, a 38 year old with a history of a fall, he was evaluated at an urgent care center and told he had a sprain. You can see some abnormalities on the lateral view there. 
And we know uh, after further uh, evaluation, including CT scan, that he has a Hoffa fracture. And uh, you can see here is a clinical photo showing displaced malunited piece. This is opened up, a femoral distractor allows you to unload the joint. You're able to mobilize that fragment, reduce it, fix it, try and get orthogonal fixation, which is executed here. You can see the alignment, excuse me, um, alignment and fixation. So in these patients with an intraarticular corrective osteotomy can be performed for Hoffa malunions. It's technically challenging. You have to worry about that blood supply, but it does offer a good, con a good outcome because it recreates the stability of the joint. Absence of that stability, uh, the patient ends up with marked malalignment and increased pain. So the take homes from that case is that the medial approach is viable. You don't want it to set posteriorly and you wanna make sure that you get compression orthogonal to the fracture line. Well, let's take it up a notch. This is actually a case of Mauricio's. 34-year-old gentleman has this open grade 3A fracture, the distal femur. You can see that it's a complex fracture in the C category. And we know that the, from the papers published from the Burn Clinic, even as far back as 1992, that these particular fractures are difficult to create and make, uh, recreate and make anatomic. And so in this situation, they had the opportunity to fix it uh, and they chose to uh, try and create some compression with screws and then create nail fix, uh, place a nail and transfix the fracture. Uh, unfortunately, they violated a number of principles, including creating a leaving prominent hardware. There's a, a lack of compression and it's a relatively unstable construct. With instability in the construct, the patient unfortunately gets pain. So it, it limits their motion and they end up with stiffness. So at five months, he was presented to Mauricio's clinic. And we can see the radiographs here. He also has uh, essentially failure of the, uh, of the uh, construct. His clinical exam is notable for limited rotation. And so the plan was a tarpo approach, arthrolysis, removal of the hardware, intraarticular osteotomy to mobilize the condyles, condyles and uh, fix them appropriately, and use a femoral distractor to restore the patient's length and then create absolute stability and fixation with plate and screw fixation. So you can see here the clinical picture after tarpo and arthrolysis. The patient's findings uh, had severe arthrofibrosis, partially healed fracture, as well as some chondrolysis at the joint. And afterwards, we see that this is fixed with absolute stability and compression. Started on CPM right away to, to uh, create and provide nutrition for the articular cartilage. And this is the, the patient at Union. You can see the uh, functional result is outstanding. And he's very fortunate to have had uh, an excellent surgeon. So the take home from this is that a lateral approach gets you access, excellent access to the joint because if you can't see it, you can't fix it. Articular congruity and metaphyseal continuity are key. Hardware impingement around the distal femur is always a potential issue as uh, Mauricio pointed out in his talk. The impact of, uh, of cartilage loss uh, or cases of impaction um, are pretty significant and require an extra set of, uh, of skills when you uh, manage these patients. And if it's a pure depression or impaction and it's already healed, it's very difficult to reestablish the normal articular congru congruity. And this was recognized in the past. In younger patients, you need to think uh, about or consider oats or an allograft. And you also may need to consider an extra articular osteotomy to unload damaged areas. So you must have a number of different skill sets available. With regard to timing in these patients, you wanna make sure you intervene as early as possible and there's a number of advantages for that. We've sort of gone through some of the indications for intervention, less than two millimeter step off instability and altered contact in the femur and tibia. But there are contraindications, those patients with infection, severe soft tissue loss, severe bone loss, non-correctable articular deformity, or advanced arthritis would be contraindications for uh, intraarticular osteotomy. So where have these cases been? If these are so important, we see them a lot in the proximal tibia. We don't really see that many in the distal femur. They're there, but I think there are fewer of them. And that's because there's improved training. I think the exposures, being able to visualize more people are aware of them, so they're able to reduce them. And I think there's also increased awareness uh, of uh, occult fractures like Hoffa fractures. 
There are a number of references which can help you with this particular topic. And these are available. But I find even more valuable are some of the older works that are more comprehensive, more technique driven. So Joe Schatzker's uh, uh, paper in the orthopedic clinics in 1990, very, very helpful. There's a very obscure book called Corrective Osteotomies in the Lower Extremity After Trauma, edited by Harholzer, which I think if we all wrote that uh, uh, Springer Verlag might uh, republish. And then Jeff Mass had an article uh, in another book called Trauma, Trauma Dis Traumatic Disorders of the Knee, also by Springer Verlag. Really, really valuable, uh, helpful uh, references. So by the way, what happened to our lady? Here she is. What I planned on doing for this particular patient was to repair the non-union and unload the medial side. She had already healed her malunion and, and her step off had, had uh, softened. And so I wanted to create stable fixation, give her, her age as well as her desire of just getting the most simple, uh, approaching it the most simply simple way, uh, went in and fixed her, her uh, non-union and unloaded the joint, as I said. So put the uh, joint line a little bit on the lateral side and got her stable fixation and she goes on to heal. So osteotomies to address these deformities are complex and they're more complex than standard osteotomies and their outcome are not as well known uh, and, e and that's because each case varies so much. So in summary for these patients, early intervention is really helpful. You have to, be under, uh, you have, to have an excellent understanding of the vascular supply, the distal femur and understand the principles and stick to them. Jeff Mast had given us some uh, wisdom in these, when he said that it's been shown that surgical correction of a case complicated by malunion, I'm sorry, by malalignment or a malaligned nonunion is very difficult. And when you critically look at them after the treatment, there's usually a fair amount of room for improvement. For this reason, undertaking in such a case is, uh, requires the utmost in planning, execution, and commitment from the surgical team. So I'd encourage you to make sure that you have all available resources before you tackle these cases. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Mike. All right, I'm going to take back over the screen. And real quickly, just a, a, a quick summary. Mauricio first spoke to us about distal femur extraarticular deformities, and he really pointed out the importance of understanding the differences between a single cut and a biplanar cut distal femur osteotomy, then went over some of the technical aspects regarding open versus closing wedge osteotomies, and then acknowledged the variety of conditions that you can address with a distal femur osteotomy. Then Mike spoke about the very challenging topic of intraarticular uh, osteotomies for malunion and nonunion. Uh, he pointed out that early intervention is critical. Vascular supply to the distal femur is not as robust on the medial side, so be aware of that. The goal of intervention is a stable joint without shear or articular step-off, and that your elderly patients may be better off with an arthroplasty. So we're running a little bit behind, but we can take a minute for questions and discussion. Uh, Mike Serkin, do, are there any, uh, any burning questions that were out there in the Q&A? And I also would like to point out to everybody, please don't use the chat function. If you want to ask a question, use the Q&A. So there's a, um, I want to remind everyone that some of these questions have been answered. So if you go to Q&A and look at answered, uh, the, the faculty have been answering some of them. There's a few here that though, that I think we can answer live. The first one is, is uh, for Michael Miranda. How late can you do these osteotomies? Well, I mean, I think the condition of the cartilage is really the key aspect. So evaluating them, those patients by MRI preoperatively is helpful. You have to make sure that you can uh, get a good image. Uh, so distracting techniques and working closely with the radiologist is key uh, so that you can uh, have, make sure that you have viable cartilage to work with when you get in there. And I think it really depends on the age of the patient. So uh, the regenerative capacity uh, obviously, and a 35-year-old is different than an 18-year-old or a 21-year-old. And so uh, for me, it depends uh, on the age of the patient, uh, the severity of the step-off, and again, what are my goals 
Like for example, with that particular patient, 70 years old, I have very limited goals with regard to her. I just want her to get a, get moving, get her bone stock back and may ultimately put her in a better situation for arthroplasty. So it really depends on, on the particular case, not so much the age of the, of the malunion. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, Jim, I think there's uh, most of the questions have been answered now by the faculty. Uh, we'll continue to monitor them. Why don't you move on in the interest of time, okay. if that's okay with you? Yeah, that sounds great. So I'm next up, uh, and I'm going to be speaking to you all about proximal tibia, extraarticular deformities, the indications and techniques. The learning goals that I have for everybody are first to, to understand what the indications are, and they're a little different than many of the earlier uh, uh, topics we've hit in this course. Uh, and then I want to discuss whether what I was taught as a resident and what many still believe, which is that if you're in varus, you need a high tibial osteotomy, whether that's true. And if it's not, why not? The third thing I'd like to discuss a little bit like Mauricio did, I want to discuss why biplanar osteotomy versus uniplanar. And then finally, we'll go over some surgical tips. Many of the indications in this course so far have involved techniques to obtain union and correct gross malalignment for function. When we start talking about the extra articular areas around the knee, the most frequent use of the high tibial osteotomy really is as a joint preserving procedure for patients with some osteoarthritis that is hopefully somewhat focal where you can potentially do a joint preserving operation. I'd like to give you a case example of uh, where these indications may play out. And so this is a patient of mine. He's a 66 year old male and he is extraordinarily active still and was very active throughout his life. Prior commander of Delta Force twice, had a 35 plus year history uh, of uh, military service, really active. And on the side, his wife had had a total knee that did not go well. So he's adamant that he does not want a knee replacement. Uh, he had a prior open supracondylar femur fracture on the same side with a vascular injury from a mortar blast. And his pain is overwhelmingly medial, even though he does have some degree of tricompartmental arthritis. So here's what his knees look like. You can see he's got varus on both sides, but it's significantly worse on that right side where you can get a feel for the supracondylar femur fracture that had occurred once as well. So First question is, is he a candidate for osteotomy? And again, in, in many cases, a lot of people would think total knee, but this patient is absolutely adamant he's not going to go there. And he is still, even with this degree of deformity, incredibly active. So he's got some degree of bilateral tricompartmental arthritis, but it is clearly worse in the medial side. Uh, bilateral varus deformity and then severe post-traumatic right lower extremity. It's a complex situation, complicated a little bit more by that earlier fracture. You can see his uh, weight bearing is way medial. So does he meet the indications? And, and, and the answer is that with what he wishes to accomplish in life, even though he's 66, he's physiologically much younger and he's, and he's uh, again, not ready for a total knee at this point. So planning is really critical. Again, if it's varus, it must be a high tibial osteotomy, right? And the answer is yes and no. He clearly had an abnormal medial uh, proximal tibial angle. But if you tried to address this entire deformity only with that, you would create an oblique joint. And I'm, I'm afraid earlier in my career, I've done this a number of times. Because what you can see is that his lateral distal femoral angle is also abnormal. So the only way you can address him is doing a double level osteotomy with a lateral femoral closing wedge and a medial tibial opening wedge. So here's what it looked like when we did that. And we were able to get him uh, a nice correction that got him down the middle. He had substantial pain relief at one year and he's now two years out. He unfortunately uh, is a very active and aggressive guy and he got too active and aggressive and broke the medial hardware, but had his full correction maintained on the femoral side and part of it on the medial side and still has not undergone a total knee and is re re remaining with his active lifestyle. So that's indications. What about the idea of varus deformity always requires a high tibial osteotomy? I'd like to show you another case. This is a patient of mine that's 33 years old, extremely active female, but multiple prior surgeries for post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Ended up having biologic replacement of both the medial and lateral compartments. And I don't want to concentrate on that. I want to concentrate on the alignment issues. This is what her alignment films look like. And what you can see here is that she's in quite a bit of varus 
And we, we can't allow that to stay that way and expect for that medial compartment uh, biologic replacement to survive. So does she need a high tibial osteotomy? Your initial thought would be probably so. She's in quite a bit of varus. But when you do the planning, and this is the Medicad software that we use, um, and, and uh, it shows that her proximal tibial angle is actually normal. It's her lateral distal femoral angle that's abnormal. So even though she's in varus, if you were to try to treat this and get her Michaelis line appropriate by doing a tibial osteotomy uh, that, that was an opening wedge, like most people would think, you would end up with severe obliquity of the joint and she would do very poorly. On the other hand, we went and did a distal femoral osteotomy. You can see it's 11 millimeters to get this correct. And what she ended up with is an 87 degree lateral distal femoral uh, angle to go with the 87 degree proximal tibial angle. So it's very important to understand that it doesn't automatically mean you need a high tibial osteotomy when you're in varus. This is showing a little bit on that case. You can see I'm trying to protect my hinge. Everything's looking good. Closing it down, hinge is still looking good. And then I did an extremely stupid thing and put a cortical screw above and I broke the hinge. So we've got a nice correction, but I've got a broken hinge. And, and an important thing to know on the femur, and we'll talk about this in a second, is if you break the hinge on the, on the uh, distal femur, you need to seriously consider placing a second plate. Because if you don't, you can easily lose that correction. You can see where we ended up with it right down the middle, which is where we wanted it, so that we're protecting both the medial and lateral sides. So don't create a joint that's oblique to the floor. The planning's absolutely critical for success. And like I said, I'm sorry to say that earlier in my career, I've done that more than once and it doesn't work. Okay, what about biplanar osteotomies? Mauricio gave a fantastic discussion of this for the distal femur. And I think that it's very important and all of my training had been in uniplanar. So this is something, again, I learned later in my career. But what, what's the reason? Why would you want to do this proximal tibia? One reason is it, it very much improves your ability to adjust correction, both the coronal and sagittal plane. So yes, with a uniplanar, you can make a little correction on your slope, but you can make a much bigger and better correction if you need to by doing the biplanar. Second reason is you have a lot better stability due to much increased surface area because of that, that cut anteriorly and then faster healing due to that increased bony surface area. So you can get the idea with this of that increased surface area that allows you to hopefully heal more quickly and be much more stable where you're not going to lose it in the sagittal plane. Let's talk real quickly about some surgical tips. Uh, you want to do a medial approach generally for the proximal tibial osteotomy. Preserve the pes tendons. There, there are different plates that are designed to protect them and, and there's just no need to take them out. Um, use a Kirshner wire to guide your cut and make sure it's an oblique orientation. You wanna aim with your, your, your cut to take, hit the tip of the fibula. Uh, uh, Professor Lobenhofer says that you wanna knock the hat off the top of the fibula and he, he always draws a little hat on the top there. So you wanna hit right to that tip. Don't cut the lateral cortex. You wanna preserve that and make sure the knee's flexed for your posterior cut so that you don't put the neurovascular structures at risk. Again, for me, I strongly believe now in a biplanar cut, and you can see kind of the drawing there to show what that angle should be in order to make that cut. And then you want to open your osteotomy very slowly and progressively to avoid fracturing that lateral hinge. Uh, the the uh, Tomofix set, which is specifically designed for tibial osteotomies, has five osteotomes in it. And if you can place those sequentially and slowly, here you see three of them placed in, it'll very slowly open up your osteotomy. Now, you don't have to have that set and you don't have to use those plates in order to do this, but if you can get a set of osteotomes, you can accomplish the same thing. But it's a very slow process to open it so that you preserve that hinge. And then you exchange those osteotomes for a lamina spreader like this and measure exactly from your preoperative planning how much you want to open it, and then you're all set. You want to stabilize the osteotomy with a plate. Any larger plate that's 4.5 or bigger can be used. There are sets like this one here that, that uh, are specifically designed for it uh, and, and make it probably a little bit easier because they're anatomically designed and they're really for that. Um, this will heal without grafting, and so you don't have to put in any graft. I do like to add bone marrow aspirate concentrate and allograft just to speed the healing process so I can let my patients get going with weight bearing earlier, but it, it will heal without it if you don't want to do that and save some money. That's an example of the system we use to get the bone marrow aspirate concentrate. What happens if you do break the hinge? So if you're doing that proximal osteotomy, if you break the hinge like that black line I just showed, 
into the tib-fib joint. It's generally stable and you don't usually need to do an open reduction internal fixation on the other side, on the lateral side. So you can just manage it conservatively, maybe go a little bit short, slower with your uh, uh, weight bearing, but you don't have to do anything else. If on the other hand, you break the hinge above the tib-fib joint, either into the joint or proximal to the tib-fib joint, at this point now, you really need to plate that laterally as well, or it's, you're gonna lose your stability. What about the distal femur? If you break that hinge, like I showed you, it tends to be unstable and you really need to plate it on the other side. Okay, so what is, what's the summary I would tell you? First, the indications most frequently involve joint preservation with post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Planning's critical. Varus does not automatically equal a high tibial osteotomy and biplanar osteotomies have many advantages. Finally, know the technique tips. If you're wondering how, how do these fit into my toolbox of handling post-traumatic osteoarthritis, for me, it's an, an issue really of physiologic age. So when I state ages, I'm really talking about physiologic age. Some older people are, are really physiologically younger and vice versa. And what does that patient desire to do over the next decade? So for me, if you're greater than 60 physiologic age and you're really ready to slow down, that patient's really ready for a total knee arthroplasty and that's the way you should go. If on the other hand, the patient's between 50 and 65, roughly again, physiologic age, not calendar, and wants to stay pretty active and has a compartment that's in decent shape, that's your patient who really can benefit from the osteotomy and, and uh, it, it can make a huge difference. And I will tell you, I've personally had a distal femur osteotomy. And first of all, I admire that guy Mauricio who had it with no anesthesia because it was a whack with anesthesia. <laughs> so that guy was tough. Uh, but, but it's a great move if you want to stay active and have a compartment that you can work with. And if you're less than 60 ish physiologic age and you want to stay really active, then consider biologic replacement. Thanks very much. I'll turn my screen over now to Tim Weber to take on the very challenging topic of the intra-articular uh, proximal tibia. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, great talk. Uh, <clears throat> let's get things set up here. Um, I've got a lot to sort of cover, uh, and I'm going to move a little bit fast. Um, I'm fascinated by how many uh, of the things that have been talked about in the first three uh, talks that uh, overlap um, and uh, are, are similar. Um, I don't really have any disclosures other than the fact that I will say that I am not an expert at this, uh, uh, but I will show or share uh, my what I what I do know. Um, we're going to cover a little bit of the pertinent uh, literature, not a lot. Um, uh, I want you to be familiar with what uh, we can potentially expect from uh, uh, intraarticular osteotomy, and then <clears throat> um, go through the actual technique uh, uh, using a couple different uh, uh, cases. So let's start with the literature first. Um, what is the risk of, of needing a total knee after a tibial plateau fracture? Uh, this study, uh, says that at 10 years, it's only about 7%, which is really pretty low. It tells us that the uh, uh, knee joint or the tibial plateau is actually quite resilient uh, and people actually do quite well after tibial plateau fractures. Um, and I'll return back to this uh, in a minute. Um, those that do need a, a, a knee replacement, um, how do they do? Well, uh, if you can get past the first two years where the complication rate was relatively high, um, you, uh, your survivorship, your 15-year survivorship is actually quite well, 96%, uh, which is pretty equivalent to if you are having your knee replaced for arthritis. The trouble with this is that, um, you know, in this study, average age is 65, and I think that uh, uh, not not too often, not too, uh, quite often, uh, we have uh, patients that are quite a bit younger than that, uh, that end up with a malunion um, and may not be the ideal candidate for a, a knee replacement. So, Rennie Marti, 
shown here um, is really uh, the master of this particular procedure, um, an interarticular osteotomy. His series of 23 consecutive patients uh, is really mind-boggling with at least five years of uh, follow-up. Um, when he looked at his results, uh, 13 years of average follow-up, uh, two patients with uh, uh, early failure and two with severe progression. Uh, but that leaves the other 19 patients, 15 of which had uh, excellent result, and four uh, with only slight progression. That's really 83% uh, with good results. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, that gives us some, some hope as to going ahead and trying to reconstruct some of these as opposed to just going straight to a, a knee replacement. Um, there are some variables relative to the knee joint uh, that are different from other joints that I, I think contribute to our ability to maybe uh, uh, be successful at a reconstruction. Uh, we've already talked at, uh, quite a bit in this course about mechanical alignment. And, and I love Mercutio's uh, uh, case earlier, where by just restoring the mechanical alignment uh, gave us uh, uh, a very arthritic knee that was uh, uh, tolerable uh, just by just by restoring mechanical alignment. Um, I want to talk just a, real briefly about joint congruity. I think that oftentimes, you know, in the knee joint, it's uh, we have the advantage of that the deformity is typically in the plane of motion. Uh, so with a lateral tibial plateau here, you'll have a step off and you'll have increased force or increased uh, uh, pressure across the joint on this section right there, but ultimately you'll end up with a, a groove that'll uh, form in the articular surface and <clears throat> secondary congruity will happen, uh, dispersing that force out across the entire knee joint, uh, which may allow us to um, uh, have a better result with the knee joint than we do in some other joints with the uh, uh, step off. Contrast that with this situation, uh, typically on the medial side where there is a significant uh, uh, step off here, but it's, it's perpendicular to the plane of motion. And this one's gonna wear out very, very rapidly. Um, with the knee joint, we also have the meniscus, which covers about 60% of the contact area when it's mapped out. It also uh, transmits greater than 50% of the axial load uh, that's applied to the knee joint. So I think these factors help in uh, allowing us uh, to reconstruct the knee joint as opposed to just replace it. Again, uh, uh, go back to Rennie Marti, and, and I think, you know, look, we all stand on, on the giants of people who came before us. Um, uh, you heard in, in Mike's uh, lecture, his, his uh, tribute to uh, Joe Schatzker, um, Renny Marti is, is the king of this uh, uh, particular procedure. Um, and you'll see this uh, as we move forward. Uh, this book is an excellent book. It's out of print now, I believe, but uh, um, if you can get your hands on it, uh, this particular crowd obviously is very interested in osteotomies and, and this is a, uh, a very useful book. Um, all right, so the operative technique. It's an anterior lateral approach. Um, <clears throat> Rennie makes a point in saying that uh, we need to free up underneath the patellar tendon down to the uh, tibial tubercle. And then it's an oblique osteotomy uh, shown here. Important to put a Weber clamp on that medial side uh, to protect that medial uh, cortex, we've heard that all morning long, both above the knee and below the knee, uh, to protect the opposite cortex. And then a laminar spreader to start opening this. The impacted articular surface uh, can be uh, first uh, 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 transcribed with a uh, uh, 2-0 drill bit and then ultimately with a uh, chisel. Here you see the increased exposure that we can get with a Gertie's tubercle osteotomy. Um, and then if we need even further uh, exposure, well, we can do a fibular head osteotomy here, allowing us to draw it even farther forward. 
once the uh, the articular surface has been uh, freed, it can be disimpacted and uh, elevated back up to its anatomic uh, position through with a bone tamp through the uh, osteotomy site. All right, so I took the liberty to go back to uh, some of Dr. Marty's uh, uh, solutions course presentations and his presentation on uh, tibial plateau uh, intraarticular osteotomies and stole a couple of his cases here. Um, so this first one, 65 year old uh, <clears throat> with a uh, male united uh, lateral tibial plateau uh, here we see uh, the deformity, uh, both uh, radiographically and uh, in, intraarticular. I think we see it a little bit better in this uh, plane here. You see the amount of uh, elevation that's going to be required for the articular surface. Um, he uses a, a drill bit here through the osteotomy site instead of from above, which I think is a really uh, a neat technique if you can see, see your uh, deformity in the articular surface that needs to be elevated. Um, and then the chisel to go ahead and uh, finish that uh, freeing up of the articular surface. Here we see the uh, lateral, the male, male united lateral cortex. Uh, and now we see the articular surface coming up uh, into position and then finally uh, level with the uh, previous articular surface. He uses a, a tricortical bone graft uh, to hold this uh, in position. Here it is six and a half years later uh, and uh, the clinical result uh, showing the uh, patient's uh, leg. We'll do one more of his cases, uh, bicondyl or tibial plateau fracture with this malunited uh, uh, tibial plateau. Deformity more in the uh, sagittal plane in this particular situation. This is his preoperative plan of what he wanted to try to accomplish. And again, uh, his post-op x-rays uh, here uh, showing uh, uh, a really nice reconstruction of the articular surface. This is the gentleman's uh, uh, clinical results at six years, along with his radiographic results, and nine-year follow-up on that same patient. We'll go through one more case. Uh, Rafi, uh, one of our faculty, uh, shared this one with me. Um, this was a patient that was treated elsewhere uh, initially, uh, and then referred to to Rafi, uh, 14 months out, 28-year-old uh, male with a bicondylar uh, tibial plateau fracture. This was how it was initially fixed. The initial surgeon's intra-op floral views, an AP and a lateral. This is it at three months, though, and you already see some of the settling in the articular step-off, uh, <clears throat> and then 12 months uh, standing alignment view. Here's a CT scan that Rafi had gotten in working this up and we can see the articular step off, essentially the pothole that uh, this gentleman was falling into. And we see it uh, also quite nicely on the sagittal view here uh, where the articular surface is significantly uh, down. Rafi goes ahead and uh, does his uh, preoperative planning, uh, is aiming at a seven degree uh, uh, various correction uh, to correct his mechanical axis. But I want to point out, um, you, this is his pre-op plan, and you can see how important it is that uh, he drew separately the articular uh, uh, impaction that is going to need to be uh, lifted back up again. Here he is circumscribing uh, the, the uh, articular uh, impaction, uh, first with a marker and then ultimately uh, gaining uh, extra exposure uh, using a fibular osteotomy, fibular head osteotomy, and then uh, ultimately uh, cutting that articular surface and elevating it back up. You see it nicely here back into uh, position. Here's Rafi. Uh, checking the mechanical axis uh, intraoperatively, making sure that uh, it's where he wants it to be. I will say that, uh, you know, the articular surface, when that comes up, that's going to correct a portion of your 
your valgus. And so your um, correction of your uh, mechanical alignment may end up being slightly less than once the articular surface is in place. And so this is a really nice technique and important to do. Here he is post-op uh, with his post-op x-rays here and uh, his mechanical alignment, uh, maybe in a little bit uh, uh, overcorrection, but uh, with this gentleman uh, in his lateral uh, compartment, maybe uh, being in the medial compartment is probably not a bad thing. Um, what's neat though is you can see the articular uh, reconstruction that Rafi was able to gain, uh, put in the articular surface right back where it was uh, previously. All right, um, so take home messages. Um, take advantage of some of the extra uh, unique factors relative to the tibial plateau uh, in the knee joint itself. Um, I think the meniscus and the orientation of the uh, uh, deformity make a, a significant difference relative to that joint versus some of the other joints. Um, our literature will support us in, in reconstructing the knee, especially in a young person. Now the technique is demanding, uh, but I think it's very doable. Thank you. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen, Jim. Thanks, Tim. I really appreciate that. I'll grab it back. And get out of my talk, which I failed to do. And then go back. Oops, sorry. Go back where we were there. And just real quickly, um, we hit the tibial side and, and I tried to speak a little bit about the extra articular deformities and talked a little bit about the indications and in that they're often involving joint preservation with uh, somewhat focal post-traumatic OA. Uh, that varus absolutely does not always mean a high tibial osteotomy. And if you remembered nothing else from the talk, I'd like you to remember that because don't create oblique joints like I did earlier in my career. Um, there are a number of advantages of biplanar osteotomies that we went through and then talked about some surgical tips, particularly opening the osteotomy slowly. And there were a number of questions about that uh, and, and ways to do that. And the, the multiple osteotomes really helps and just go slow, let that bone have some chance to adjust as you're opening it. Then the need or lack of need for grafting and then what to do if you do break the lateral hinge. Tim then talked about, again, the really difficult topic of the intraarticular ones and discussing the pertinent literature related to malunions of the proximal tibia, being familiar with the results of proximal tibia intraarticular osteotomies, and then the steps to be described. So we are running a little bit late. Uh, I, I had cleared off all the question and answer ones unless any more have come through just while I've been doing that little summary. Mike, were there any others or should we move on to the cases? Uh, I think there's a really good question uh, okay. that uh, isn't there, but that uh, was sent to me personally and it's, um, how do you predict the joint line obliquity during planning? Uh, you said it a few times, um, but you really haven't described how to know this is going to happen. Um, it, I think it can be a little bit difficult to predict. So what do you do? I think the key there is to use planning software and I'd never used it before a few years ago. And frankly, I have to give the credit to my partner Mauricio uh, for this one. He, he had, uh, uh, become aware of the Medicad software. And it's just one of many. Uh, there, there's uh, the one that has been mentioned a number of times that is available free of charge uh, that, that a number of guys use. There's Medicad, which is not free of charge, but we've, we've purchased. And anything, you could do it by hand too, if you're patient enough and good enough, but measuring all of the angles and then looking at what you're really around the knee, the, the things you wanna look, like, look at most are the lateral distal femoral angle the medial proximal tibial angle. And both of those you want in the 87, 88 degree range, ideally. And then, and then there's a little bit of a range you can go with. If you see that you're, you're looking at a patient in varus, but they have a normal proximal tibial angle and it's really either joint line congruence angle or the, the lateral distal femoral angle that's off. If you don't address the side that's off, you will end up with a joint that's oblique. If you address the side that is abnormal, and that may be the distal femur, even though they're in varus, then you will avoid, you'll have a joint that's horizontal with the floor. 
And, and I think making this mistake is why osteotomies got a bad name for a while in North America, because there was an article printed when I was training that said, if you do it, it makes the total joint being done later more like a revision. And I think that's because people were making oblique joints by going with the, the mantra that if it's, if it's in varus, you need an HTO. So I, I think the, the short answer is either by, by hand measuring all those angles, or I would recommend that you use one of the planning softwares. And as long as you do that, I think you can make sure if you keep the angles normal, you won't, you won't have an obliquity. Uh, thanks, Jim. I think that's great. Um, there are some more questions, but I think you're better off going to the uh, cases. They may be answered. And if not, we can come back to them. Okay. I do want to remind everyone, uh, that we are going to get, we're currently working on putting up the MediCAD software video on our YouTube channel uh, for the osteotomy course. And I'm gonna show everyone how to get there, as well as there are uh, demonstrations of how to use Bone Setter, which is the other uh, application, which uh, Dr. Standard mentioned up on our YouTube channel and videos on how to do some pre-op planning, especially around the hip. So they, those can be some good resources for you uh, that may help you in the future. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and I, I tell you, I can't, I can't stress enough the importance of using one of those and, and planning. Um, again, I, I made mistakes early in my career by not doing that. So uh, learn from my mistakes instead of making your own. Um, I have a couple of cases here that, that Mauricio uh, provided to me, and, and we're going to use Mike, Tim, and Mauricio as our expert panel. We may not get through both because we're running a little bit late, but we'll get through what we can. This first case is a 39-year-old male, history of a knee fracture about two years previous, but he did not have access to medical treatment at the time of the injury. His current complaints really are overwhelmingly pain and instability with deformity, and it, it's bad enough that he can't work, and that's obviously creating big problems for him. Here's a video that shows if you watch him walking, he has a varus deformity, pretty significant thrust and a limp. And you can see how gingery is with walking. And you can imagine why it's pretty darn hard for him to do any, any meaningful work that involves anything physical. So that gives you an idea of what his ability to ambulate is. So here's radiographs. Uh, question is, what are the problems? So I'd throw that out to any of our three expert panelists. So we can see here that he has an intra-articular uh, malunion as well as uh, axial uh, malalignment. He's got coronal plane, I'm sorry, sagittal plane uh, uh, malalignment as well, uh, malunion I should say, um, on the proximal tibia. So his joint is subluxing, his distal femur is sliding off on the medial side and that's the uh, um, I'm sure creating some of the problem with thrust. So he's got a fairly challenging problem. You bet. And if you take a look, this is uh, showing the, the Kafuri and Schatzker classification that uh, uh, Mauricio and Joe went and kind of re-looked at how to do a three-dimensional look rather than Joe's original classification that so many of us use, uh, which was two-dimensional. And uh, they, they broke the knee into quadrants, uh, kind of down the middle, like you see, and then uh, from the anterior aspect of the fibula to the posterior aspect of the collateral ligament. And this was a 4P, so uh, type 4, medial side, posteriorly, step off, that is what, what you're having to deal with in order to address this person's problem. So any of the panelists, any thoughts on, on how you should proceed? Yeah, I think this is uh, uh, obviously a very complex one uh, uh, involving medial tibial plateau, uh, which is a little less common. But uh, um, in Rennie Markey's article, he would say uh, proceeding with a tibial tubercle osteotomy on this so that you can get full visualization. Because really, not only do you have to bring that posterior articular surface back up again on the uh, medial side, but you also have to narrow the joint. Uh, so cleaning out that um, impacted intraarticular portion on the lateral side uh, is, going to, is going to be necessary as well. His comments uh, in his article and his book would say um, going after uh, both of them requires a, a tibial tubercle osteotomy 
to be able to get that visualization. Okay, thanks, Tim. And I'll tell you, that's something that is often underappreciated that Tim was talking about. I hope my arrow is showing, but do you see the width here where this, this condyle is so much wider than the femur? Um, when you get that over a five millimeter difference, and if you leave it that way, that leads to really poor results. And so that's what Tim was pointing out that, yeah, you have to, you have to elevate back up this, uh, what you see on the lateral view here and get that back up in order to address this problem. But if you leave him wide like this, he's not going to do well. So you really have to address both. So thank, thanks for that comment, Tim. That's, that's one that a lot of people don't pay attention to. So let me show you some 3D CT views. You can see what that looks like. Any comments from anybody? Mauricio, you know this case pretty well. Any thoughts? Well, um, as, as was pointed out, this patient uh, had a various dislocation. And as a matter of fact, uh, he was not having, the big issue with this patient was instability. As you can see, there is no containment to the tibial plateau rim. And this is the biggest problem that this patient is dealing with. And most of those type 4P, they cross the midline, they compromise the tibial spines, and they extend themselves to the posterior lateral rim, causing some degree of depression, as Tim pointed out. Uh, but to me, as a priority number one, is to understand where the main fracture plane is located, how to restore the containment of this tibial plateau, and how to restore the alignment. Okay. And can you give just a little bit more, uh, you, you've said the term before and it's such an important one, but the whole concept of containment. Sure. This concept was brought up by Joe Schatzker and I have the privilege to, to share with him and to learn from him. And, uh, and basically what we got to learn, and if you go to the literature, you see in the past when Apley was treating the tibial plateaus, he was applying traction and ligamental taxis just to restore alignment in some degree of containment without internal fixation. Some articles show that even some degree of articular step-offs are, are really tolerated, but lack of containment is not. And this is what you said, when you don't have containment, you have a subluxation of the joint and the joint is unstable and this is not going to go to a good place. So what we try to do, we try to restore the rim and this is the very basic principle of the, the classification that we ended up publishing in 2018 to understand that the rim of the tibial plateau and the containment of the metaphysial upper tibia is critical to restore stability to the joint. You bet. Mike, I saw there were a number of Q and A's. Is there anything that you're seeing from the audience that we need to address here? Um, the question uh, was, uh, do you consider that the femur dictates the joint line or the obliquity of the joint? Not necessarily. So actually, th this is a great one. So you can see the Medicad software here projected onto this case. And in this case, the femur, the lateral distal femoral angle is 85.2, which falls within the normal range, just barely. And the proximal tibial angle is only 68, which is way off. Um, and so in this case, the, the femur is not dictating the obliquity, but the proximal tibia is. And so really what you want to do is get both of these two angles into the green, the normal, uh, in order to have this work out. So again, there you see the two projected onto each other. And this shows what the compartment looks like. And you can see that step off medially. You can see how the body's been trying to put some fibrocartilage in there to try and repair it as well as it can. There's your intercondylar notch. So this is what they started to do. Uh, any comments from any of our panelists? That's absolutely how I would approach it. I would certainly uh, go posterior and try and elevate that fragment, uh, mobilize it so you can start normalizing that. And then uh, once you do that, then you can sort of uh, see what you uh, have as a residual deformity in the lateral compartment. Okay. Would everybody go prone? I'd be tempted personally to go supine because I think I can get to the posterior medial side really well supine. And that would allow me to do like what Tim was talking about with the osteotomy if needed and clean out that lateral side to try and get the intercondylar width back as well. You're a better man than I, Jim. I can't do that. I can't get uh, all the way back there because uh, to me, it's almost like this competing agendas because if you're supine, 
in order to get access and visualization, you have to have the leg flexed in the figure four position, but I'm trying to mobilize that piece posteriorly. So I'm trying to elevate that and extension and valgusization is what gets me that. So I kind of have, I'm trying to fight to fight to see, but at the same time, I'm trying to fight to reduce this. So I, I preferentially would go prone just because uh, uh, you know I just don't have the skill set to be able to get back there. I agree with yeah. Mike Miranda very much. Uh, I would say, uh, to me, the key element of this uh, non-union is the postural medial rim instability. And I would like to get it completely right before I, I consider to do something else. Hey, Jim. Yes. Regarding access. The, the I think the access is uh, uh, easier prone. And if this was an acute fracture, I would definitely be back there prone. I think the... Um, uh, challenging part is uh, getting a good read. So from prone, we can't see the articular surface very well. It's strictly a cortical read. And if we were coming in uh, from anterior, and I know it's, it's a big uh, strip of soft tissue uh, coming around that medial side, but um, we can then actually look into the articular surface and get the articular surface right. Um, it does make it a lot more challenging uh, to buttress, uh, but you know at the same time, I think that there there's maybe an advantage uh, to to be in on the front side. I would want to understand that lateral uh, deformity much better to know whether I was going to be able to handle that there, or if it's better to just do two approaches: start in the back, get the back right. Uh, and then ultimately uh, address that lateral side uh, through a second approach. As a detail, and I appreciate your comments, Tim. Uh, as uh, Jim Stenner pointed out or presented, uh, we scope the knee first. So we scope the knee first to evaluate the joint surface and to see how the lateral compartment was looking like, how the intercondylar notch was looking like. And uh, we understood uh, that if we could reduce this postural medial split using C-arm in trying to level out the postural medial fragment, it could be an option to restore the rim. And this is the reason why we decided to go prone. Uh, and when we go from anterior, and I do remember Joe Schatzker saying that in the 70s, this is the way they were used to approach those cases from the front, doing tibial tubercle osteotomies as Rennie and Marty did as well. And the soft tissues dissection is really huge in those cases. And the complication rate, um, according to Schatzker, and also was not great. So uh, I think obviously you've heard some different ideas of ways you could do it and everything's a trade-off. Um, and so what I would say is make sure you develop a technique that you're really good at. And uh, two thoughts, go where the money is. So that's posterior medial for sure. And, and, and get good at approaching it one way or another, and then stick with what you're good at. Because one person may be able to do it one way and another person another. Mike Sirkin, you had a comment real quick and we're starting to run short on time. So I want to make sure we answer whatever. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a comment. It's a question from the audience. There were a couple of them. So what is the, you know, you talked about the width of the tibia, uh, proximal tibia as compared to the distal femur. And when it's wide, it doesn't do very well. What is that normal relationship? And do you see any variance in circumstance, whether it be age, uh, race, or something else? There's, there's a real old paper, and I'm right now blanking on, on the na name of the lead author, but um, it was supposed to be a difference of five millimeters or less between the two. So you can be five millimeters or less and you're fine, but if you start getting wider than that, and you often see that with tibial plateau fractures, you need to concentrate on getting that, that width back to a normal relationship. I haven't noticed a big difference regarding races or ages, but any of the other panel members have any comments on that? I would say that um, when we talk about width in this case, again, we go back to the concept of containment. Uh, what Stanner is saying is that we try to restore the containment to the normal width of the tibial plateau. And uh, it's normal to see a little bit of extra size on the lateral side, but you see the, the lateral subluxation here is a way improved just because there is no more posterior medial dislocation anymore. And um, you see the width is restored just by restoring the posterior medial containment in this case. 
And yes, it's not a perfect reconstruction of the joint because you can see this tibial spines that have a fibrous union and you may have some cartilage issues on the lateral aspect of the tibial plateau. But for sure, uh, the critical thing is to restore alignment and stability to the joint in this case. And you can see how well uh, that, that width came back to a normal relationship. That's a less than five millimeter difference. And so it uh, really, really made a big difference. And, and just addressing that intra-articular deformity really made a huge difference for this patient. So uh, we are unfortunately running out of time. So I'm going to end there and not do the second case. And hey, Jim, just one quick question for yeah. all of you in, in a minute or two. And I know we were running late, but I saw this come up many times. Can you all just briefly comment on weight bearing for both the extra articular and the intra articular osteotomies on either side of the joint? For, for me, me, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, it's Mike Miranda. Um, so I typically will have these folks foot flat touchdown weight bearing for the first six weeks, um, and then partial weight bearing for another six weeks and then start them weight bearing as tolerated at three months. Uh, I'm sure that that's uh, um, a little bit different from other folks. It's a little bit slow on the slower side, but I have them folks emphasize, patients emphasize range of motion uh, during that first six weeks. And so when they come in at six weeks, I wanna make sure that they're, they have excellent range of motion in their knee, uh, especially in extension. That's an, another thing that I prioritize. You wanna make sure that the patient doesn't end up with a flexion contracture um, and then uh, working on strength uh, isometrics uh, initially, and then working on resistance uh, after six weeks. Yeah, I agree with the foot flat for sure. And for me, it depends. If it's a closing wedge osteotomy, I think you can be uh, quite a bit more aggressive than that uh, if you've got good fixation. If it's opening wedge, then you need to go a little bit slower. But I'll typically allow foot flat right away and then kind of what advance your weight bearing is tolerated on, on a closing wedge if it, if it looks good. And that'll typically be uh, about 25% right away and then 50% at three to four weeks and then advance from there. If it's opening wedge, I'll, I'll have them go foot flat till about four weeks and then start advancing. I would also add that the things that you have to take into consideration is the bone implant construct, if you're using locking plates or not and how the hinge of your osteotomy looks like, you really, if you really have preserved your hinge or not. And it's a critical thing in case your hinge is compromised that you consider to buttress the hinge to, to grant more stability in early weight bearing. Yes. All right, I'm gonna quickly move us through so we don't lose everybody. Um, a summary and takeaway from, from the whole course really is we wanted to talk about indications of paraticular knee deformity correction and non-union management. Utilize the deformity correction techniques to restore extra articular alignment and hopefully salvage joints and then recognize operative techniques for intra-articular osteotomies. I'm gonna turn it now to, to Michael Sirkin to describe because we have a lot of extra people on this week uh, how you can catch up on the course if you wish and uh, and learn a lot more about this course. Mike? So I'm, uh, I'm here on in Google and what I want you to do is just, you know, if you just Google AONA, it'll bring you up to our uh, homepage that you can then click on um, and then click on trauma. And what you'll see is this about the osteotomy weekly. If you just click on learn more, this then brings us to the main page for this course. And what it'll allow us to do is you'll see the different dates. And we have a lot more people here that haven't started the course yet. And what you can see is going all the way back to the beginning of the course, you can catch up because we have the videos for each of these uh, courses from week one all the way down to where we are now. And we just did, today's May 30th, periarticular knee and distal femur. And all the ones above that have a recording and a video linked to YouTube and you can go ahead and catch up on the course. In addition, for the upcoming weeks, if you just click on one of these links, these links will take you directly to the registration page and you'll be able to go ahead and register for the course um, 
uh, for this course directly, okay? So that's one thing I wanted to show you. The other thing I wanted to show you is how to, you know, we go to YouTube and this is the YouTube main page, right? And so if you just Google AO Trauma North America, it'll bring you to this. This is our AO Trauma North America web page, uh, sorry, YouTube page. And you can just click on that. You won't have these same blue buttons that I have. Yours will ask to subscribe. And so go ahead and subscribe to the channel because that'll help us out, be able to get things to come more to the top. The next thing I want you to do is go right here in the middle here, third from the right, click on playlists. And right here, currently now second, if everyone can see that on the top row, we see the osteotomy course. If you just click on view full playlist, I have mine organized by when they were posted. So if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see week one. And we have here week one, which was the beginning of the course. We have week one, and then this course is run on Saturday with the Ask the Expert session on Thursday. And you can go through the entire course, week one, then we go to week two, okay? And then we go up to week three and week four, et cetera. In addition to, we just had uh, four excellent lectures and the entire lecture, the entire hour and a half will be inside of this osteotomy week. It'll say osteotomy, obviously week seven, um, and it will have the entire hour and a half lecture. But what we'll also do is we're going to break down each of the individual lectures. So we'll take out Jim's lecture, we'll take out Tim's lecture, Maurizio's lecture, um, et cetera, and we will post them up and you can look at each one of those individually if you want to review just that. And so I want to thank all of you for attending. I, like I said, there's a lot of new people that have joined us. I, I welcome you. I remind you that um, this Thursday we will have uh, another review of this and it will be Ask the Experts. Jim will take his faculty and review through all of this. And next Saturday we will have a discussion group uh, and an Ask the Expert session that go that goes ahead and um and goes ahead and discusses these cases as well so jim that's all i had okay sounds great angel did you have the uh uh post uh course um uh, questions questions that people were going to answer yeah so we'd really appreciate it if you guys would answer these questions so that we can continue to make these better and better And then once you finish that, we appreciate you coming. Uh, it's been a, a great group and I would really strongly encourage you to join us Thursday evening for the uh, Ask the Ex Experts and then next Saturday, we'll be going through cases. Uh, we only got through one today, but we've got a whole bunch of cases and uh, this incredible group I've got working with me that we'll run through and hopefully really hit a lot of these topics and really hit more of the, the surgical tricks and things to hopefully help you all have uh, really great results with these. Really want to thank uh, the the other three that that participated here. It's a, a lot of work. I know you all went to, and and uh, I think your lectures were truly outstanding. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Jim. Pleasure to be here. Honored to be part of this uh, group. You guys uh, just do such a great job and learn so much. I learned too. Thank you. Most definitely. And then, uh, what, when you're, no, go ahead, Mike. No, just uh, reiterating the, uh, the feelings. And once you've answered the questions, again, uh, I really encourage you to go to that YouTube page and to the website. Um, the the uh, work that's been done to put this course up on on those sites has been really amazing and it, it leaves you with the whole course available at your fingertips so that you can really re-review it 